I mean, I she everyone was screaming for help. I we got, it got so hot. It felt like this is basically the feeling I can describe the bet I can best describe. It felt like you were pinned against the wall from all directions and you like I would lift up my legs and I would not move. I'm Dr. J Mac and I am haunted by what happened at the Travis Scott concert at Astro World Festival on November 5th. All the details um, are still coming out daily. We're learning more as the days and the hours pass. Um, but it sure seems like we have another incident where there was a crowd surge and something called a crowd crush, which is when you have a significant amount of people densely packed in an area to the point where you are chest to chest with other human beings and you can't expand your chest wall. And when your chest wall can't expand, you can't respire. And when you can't respire, you can't get oxygen in, you can't get carbon dioxide out. The first thing that happens is your carbon dioxide levels raise to a point where you get lightheaded, you get confused, you might even get euphoric, and then you go out. You'll, you'll go into a coma, maybe not a permanent coma, but, but you'll pass out. And then your oxygen levels will continue to drop, and then you won't get enough oxygen to your brain, and you know where that goes. I'm an emergency medicine doctor in Texas, so this hits home for me. This could have been me. I could have been working in that emergency room, taking care of these hundreds of people that were that were bring, being brought in simultaneously. And as a doctor that sometimes works in major emergency rooms overnight, sometimes by myself, I can't imagine what it was like for the hospital, the hospital staff, the people at the concert, the victims themselves, the people who organized the festival, Travis Scott, everybody will forever be changed because of what happened on Friday. From a hospital perspective, I have to think that they went into a mass casualty mindset, which is when you accept the fact that you don't have enough resources to adequately treat every single human being that shows up. And you have to go into a, a totally different mode of practicing medicine. And that's figuring out who's on the verge of death. I mean, as an emergency doctor, we're always thinking about this, but when we have a hundred people show up at the same time, this is the most important time that we do. Who's gonna die in the next five to 10 minutes? who has a life-threatening injury, who has something terrible, but can wait. And you try to put your most experienced people up front to determine which one of these categories these people are in. Because if you miss at something that immediately needs medical attention or something that is going to take someone's life within hours, that could sit with you for the rest of your life you will permanently change that person's life because of a missed triage. So the weight of this event from so many perspectives has just been suffocating me personally as an emergency physician. And thinking about it from the EMS perspective, think about the medics that were on site. People are blaming them, saying the paramedics didn't know what they were doing. Of course they knew what they were doing. Of course they were trained for this. But when you have 50,000 people crammed together and somebody is passed out in the middle, not even counting 100 people passed out, if there's one person passed out in the middle of 50,000 people and nobody's getting out of the way, how are you going to blame that on the emergency providers? How are they supposed to get in there with their tour? Are they supposed to crowd surf over everybody? with their backboard and their stethoscopes and their C-collars to stabilize the cervical spine. There's so many people to blame. Honestly, there are so many people to blame. And I may get heat from this, but Travis Scott is not the only human being that is to blame here. Yes, he should have stopped the show the minute that anyone's health is threatened. In any situation in life, you stop what you're doing and everybody gets together 
to help that individual. That is the biggest failure of what happened on Friday. There are a ton of failures, but the biggest failure is that despite their lack of preparation and organization, they didn't stop everything they were doing the minute that a human life was at risk. This isn't the first time something like this has happened at a concert. In fact, this happens kind of regularly. The last time this was in US media was in 2000 at a Pearl Jam concert. Nine people died, something like 27 plus people were seriously injured. And this happened multiple times this year as well. It just happened outside of what the US media is, is more aware of. And to me, I don't understand how we haven't learned from this before. Clearly, when you have a mass of 50,000 people, there needs to be organization, there needs to be structure, there need to be walkways, there need to be areas where the crowd can ebb and flow because if you have 50,000 people packed in together and there are barriers around that 50,000 people and everybody starts moving back and forth, what happens to the people that are against the barriers? What happens to the person that's five foot two in the middle of that crowd of 50,000 people that's getting their chest crushed? I interviewed a teenager that was there, actually somebody that I know personally, a family that I respect a lot and care about a lot. And he was in a position to where maybe he would have lost his life. He, he felt that compression. He knew the second song in at the Travis Scott concert that he had to get out of there. The second song he turned to his friend. They waited for six months to see this concert. And he turned to his friend and he said, we got to get out of here, man. But he couldn't. He knew something was terribly wrong and he couldn't get out of that crowd. And his friend that's 5'2", he's over six foot. His friend that's 5'2", is next to him getting crushed and there's nothing he can do to protect her. There's some simple things that you can try to do, try to do in this situation. When you notice that way too many people are together, this doesn't just happen at concerts, by the way. So don't just think, oh, I'm just not gonna go to a concert and this will never happen to me. Crowds can end up forming in situations where maybe a building is on fire and everybody has to run together to get out of the building. Maybe there's some sort of like bump that like, who knows what situation you're gonna be in. Don't ignore this and pretend that if you just don't go to a concert, you're never going to be in danger. But one of the first things you can do is get your arms up. By putting your arms up, not having them crushed at your sides, you're potentially putting some extra space where your chest wall can expand. You can inhale oxygen, you can exhale carbon dioxide. This is one of the big killers, if not the biggest killer during a crowd surge. You have to stay upright. You have to stay upright. I know that's hard to say because once you fall, how do you get up when the weight of 10 plus people may be on top of you? But that's where everybody has to become responsible for each other. That's where everybody has to join together. Make sure this thing stops and gets that person up. So be aware of your center of gravity. At the same time, though, you have to go with the flow. If a crowd of 50,000 people has wave, literally you can watch videos of waves going through crowds of people. And if you're in that wave, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Go with it. Have your arms up. Go with it. Don't fight it. You're going to waste your energy pushing up against these inevitable forces that are going to take you in a certain direction. And once you're in the surge, I don't know how you avoid this, but if you're by a wall or a barrier, do everything you can to get out of that particular area because you can imagine a wave of thousands of people getting pushed towards you and then you're pushed towards an immovable object. Obviously, not only are you increased risk to have serious traumatic injuries, rib fractures, 
cervical spine injuries, closed head injuries, bleeding inside your brain. But you could get crushed to the point where you can't adequately breathe. When I interviewed one of the participants, he said he naturally knew to put his arms up. He'd never heard that before. But the first thing he did when he felt people closing in was get his arms up. He just knew instinctively to create space in between his chest wall and other people. That's crazy. That survival instinct is there. But he said in terms of getting out of that crowd, the only thing you could do was go with the flow. He knew that instinctively as well. Don't fight it. Go with the flow and hope you get spit out on the side. Hope that the current of human beings will take you in a direction of safety. So much of this is so heavy in so many ways. I personally, you know, am, am shook by this for a lot of different reasons, but because somebody I know saw 20 people, 10 to 20 people passed out. If one person in a crowd of 50,000 people saw 10 to 20 people passed out, imagine how many people actually passed out. He said people were fighting. That also kind of makes sense the sympathetic surge in your body, the adrenaline starts to spike. Adrenaline isn't just a term that people throw around. Like, you know, the adrenaline kicks in and crazy things happen. We, that's a real phenomenon. We have a sympathetic nervous system. We have a parasympathetic nervous system. When then that sympathetic nervous system surges, your norepinephrine surges as well. Your heart starts racing. Your heart beats faster and harder. Your pupils actually hone in on what's going on. You can see better. Your binocular vision improves. And you're ready for a lion to attack you. But a lion isn't attacking you. A crowd of 50,000 people is threatening your life. And how do you respond to that? Some people just freak the hell out. And they start pushing. And they start punching and kicking and kneeing. And it's terrible and it's inexcusable, but from a medical perspective, it makes sense. What would you do in that situation? A lot of people would protect their lives at any cost. That kind of goes back to the whole, you don't know somebody until you've seen them in war kind of a thing. That's one thing that my grandfather used to tell me, you don't truly know another human being until you've seen them in a warlike scenario. People are capable of terrible things, but it's because they're protecting the most important thing that their brain knows themselves. I think moving forward, there are a lot of people that, that need to focus on their role in these events. And I'm not just talking about concert organizers. I'm talking about the artists too. I'm talking about security at the event. I'm talking about the emergency responders. I'm talking about the governmental level. This can't happen. Eight people died. How many people almost died? There was one person's firsthand account of closing her eyes and holding her friend's hand and thinking that she was dying. She reached that level of euphoria. Her, again, chest was compressed to the point where she couldn't breathe out carbon dioxide. Her carbon dioxide levels rose and her brain told her, this is it. This is the end. She survived, fortunately, 
but we can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. And again, this isn't just a US thing. This is a whole world thing. This has happened twice already this year during a pandemic. How often does this happen outside of a pandemic? A lot of people need to make changes. Travis Scott is one of them. Yes. But so many others do as well. But I'll leave it with this. Every single one of us needs to take responsibility for another human being's life. In any situation in your life, don't think to yourself, somebody else will protect that human being's life. That's called diffusion of responsibility. It's a well-known psychological phenomenon that happens. You think to yourself, there's all these people around, somebody's gonna do something. Somebody's gonna help that person. And if you think that way, somebody's gonna die. And you're gonna live with that for the rest of your life. So no matter what your role is in these settings, where you see another human being whose life is at risk. You have to know that it's your responsibility. It's not somebody else's to step up to the plate and to help. That's, that is the one thing that would have saved eight humans lives on November 5th. If everyone thought of themselves as the only human being that could help another human being, those eight people would be alive today. Now we're going to talk to somebody who was actually there in the middle of the surge itself, feeling their chest crushed by the weight of 50,000 people. Um, his name is Joe, and, uh, and I know him personally, and I know his family personally and care about all of them and respect them. So this is just totally crazy for me, but thank you in advance, Joe, um, for being open to talking about this terribly traumatic experience. Joe, my man, thank you so much for joining us today, brother. How are you feeling? I'm really excited. Um, also, uh, yeah, excited <laughs> cool, to share man. this. Well, we're excited to have you here um, talking about this. And honestly, like I, I really appreciate you being open to discussing this because I know that this was probably a really traumatic experience for you to have. And this just happened three days ago. Yeah, it, it definitely was. I'm glad to be here. Um, but it was, it was really traumatic. The first few days were actually like surprisingly hard. I wasn't expecting anything from it. I mean, we went, when we got out of the surge, um, me and a few friends, we went uh, kind of back of the crowd and, you know, we had a great time. And uh, one of my friends who was a girl, she's still kind of struggling with, with it because oh, you know, wow. it's, it's a lot. Like, I mean, yeah. you know, when you're seeing people who are passed out and right. getting dragged off, it's kind of scary. Put us in this setting, man. So, so, you know, obviously you've been looking forward to this for a long time. Did you have tickets to the original event that was canceled last year? Uh, no, we, uh, got tickets around six months ago when they first came out. Some, okay. So you're time. looking forward to this for six whole months. You're yeah. able to talk your parents into going to this concert, which I know your parents personally, and I know they weren't <laughs> excited about you going all the way to Houston to do this yeah. thing. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and as you're entering this festival, did, did you see any red flags or warning signs along the way? Uh, not in the first few moments, um, but in the first few hours, yes, because, uh, we, when we first got there, we went into the merch line and it was a, it was a pretty long line. I'd say a good few hour wait. We were, so we were in there for two hours. You and, waited two uh, hours for merch. Oh yeah. And we didn't get it either. So oh my they shut it down because there was a raid. They were trying to raid and get, uh. Yeah, and it was crazy. Everybody was jumping over fences. And then we saw people sneaking in and thousands of people were sneaking in. And instantly they, they just decided, 
okay, continue the concert. And I think they did not go through security, anything. When did you start to get a sense that something really serious was happening? We got there early. We left while Lil Baby, who is another rapper who's really good. We left mid-concert mm. so we could get good seats at the Travis Scott concert. Mm. Um, so we waited for about an hour and a half to just, and we were like right where you don't want to be because we weren't super up front, but we were right in the middle. And then everybody, I mean, tens of thousands of people when the little baby, when little baby was done performing, just came over and just were trying to get good seats. They were running over. It was really dangerous. Um, I mean, you say good seats, but there are no seats, right? They just wanted to get a good yeah, position. It, it's open. Standing, correct? Yeah. yeah. It's just like one huge ball of humans oh, yeah. squished into together watching yeah. this performance correct it was a space that didn't was not meant to fit fifty thousand people i'll tell you that right now and mm. even more than fifty thousand people because people snuck in so early on when people were rushing through the vip gates and pushing over fences and rushing over the fences did you see any of that stuff happen yeah, I mean, before the concert started, that was happening. I mean, there was movement. It was getting pretty tight. It wasn't super, like, dangerous. It wasn't anything crazy. But um, then the first start, song started, and uh wasn't any r- red flags. It was really fun. We were all recording. It, it, you know, it was, it was a blast. And then the second mm-hmm. song came on, Heist in the Room, and instantly I told Zach, I was like, dude, we got to get out of here. Because I was with uh, one of my friends who's 5'3 and a girl. And she's screaming. She's like, ow, ow, ow. And what? Was, oh, yeah. I mean, it was really dangerous. I mean, I. I so was literally having- second <laughs> song in, second song in. And you're already like, this is crazy. We're going to get hurt. You already oh, knew that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When second song started, it was we, we had to get out. We knew we had to get out. I mean, I, she, everyone was screaming for help. I, we got, it got so hot it felt like this is basically the feeling i can describe the bet i can best describe it felt like you were pinned against the wall from all directions and you like i would lift up my legs and i would not move i would not move and you just go with the crowd you go wherever they wanted you and then eventually we're in there for 20 minutes and we just see people on the ground passed out circles and i mean we, we would see pits but they weren't pits they were just people punching each other and uh people giving cpr and i mean it it was really just it was abnormal it was something i've never seen before so it was just oh my gosh dude so right now i mean are you as you go on through your normal days i mean you went to school today right you're in high school you went to school today correct as you're going on throughout your day are you like re-experiencing some of this stuff that that you saw on Friday and you experienced? So um, today wasn't nearly as bad as it was yesterday. Um, Cause yesterday I kind of, like I was talking to one of my friends who I trust very dearly and I was like really struggling. Like actually, like, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's, and I found out, I was thinking about it by myself. And I feel like the reason I felt, I guess traumatized would be the word. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not because of the, this kind of sounds bad but it wasn't because of the people or people getting hurt. It was the emotion that I felt. I've never felt terror, absolute terror. And um, I think uh, to that level was Mm -hmm. scary. In in that moment, and this is a very strong word coming from a Christian, and I don't use this word like ever, Mm -hmm. but that crowd felt demonic. Not Travis Scott, not the performance. That crowd felt demonic. People were trying to get out. And a lot of people were kind of arrogant, acting tough or whatever. And they're just like, no, go around. Or someone would get mad because they're like trying, they're shoving them over and then they'd shove and then fights would start. But I saw this big pit and, um, you know, one dude was just grabbing someone and punching someone. And then literally right next to him was someone giving CPR. Because I I saw probably around 20 people passed out and two people. You saw 20 people passed out? Probably around, yeah. Did you at any point think that your life was truly at risk? I know that you were afraid at one point, but could you, could you feel the fact that you may die tonight? 100%. I, and that's what I was talking about feeling that amount of terror 
for 25 minutes, five songs, however long, was, I mean, one, yeah, for sure. And it scared me because not only was it my life, but it was two of my friends' lives. So it was like, and I felt responsible for them. And I, I, I'm like above average height. Like I'm six, above six foot. Right. And, um, you know, I, I was struggling to breathe. I was struggling to see. I couldn't, with all my strength, could not move anyone. I was wasting my time. It was, it was really. And you're with a friend who's how tall? Probably like five, three, five, four. And so you're and, over six foot yeah. and you're looking down at your friend who's five, three or five, four. She's getting crushed from the, the crowd around her. I mean, what do you, what do you do in that situation? You know, you don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. You, you, you have to basically get lucky that the crowd takes you in a good spot. That is, yeah. that is what you're relying on. You're relying on the crowd. I mean, you're basically like in an ocean of human beings and the riptide is stronger than anything yep. that you could yep. physically control. And you, your only hope is to just go with the current. And uh, another thing I'd like to add, this is my opinion, but you can kind of take it however you want. Sure. Um, and it's kind of, it's been very controversial the last few days, but I truly believe that it is not. I, I do think Travis Scott is semi at fault. I do not believe he is fully at fault. And I believe this because he had earbuds in, was on the high of the stage. And I promise you, if someone fell down, it condensed, the crowd condensed so quickly, I couldn't see the people below me. So I don't know how Travis Scott who is supposed to see me. He's performing. And it is, bottom line is, it's not his job to stop the show. It's his job for security to tell him when to drop, stop the show. And he stopped it not once, but twice. Stopped it twice. And that, he, that shouldn't be, security should have been trained because they were clearly not trained properly. Medics were not trained, trained properly. And I was reaching out to uh, one of the securities. I was like, please, she's about to pass out. Please take her. She's like, sorry, we can't do anything unless uh, she's passed out. Yep. So they're waiting for people to lose consciousness they before out. they try to intervene? Yep. They can't, they will not do anything unless you passed out. I even, uh, this is kind of bad, but you know, I was doing anything I could think of in that moment to make sure my friend was safe. And I said, um, please, she has diabetes, blood sugar's low. And so they're like, sorry, we cannot help you unless you're unconscious. Word for wow. word. And was that true? Did she have diabetes? No, she did not. I, I, but that that's is something that's I made up. So smart. I thought she Honestly, was, though, that. that's, that's so smart it's, to be able to, yeah. to do anything you can to get them to intervene because if they're just ignoring what's happening, clearly multiple people are having significant medical issues and they're just, it's like, so I think that there are two things at play here, honestly. Like as a doctor, I see thousands of people involved in any tragic accident. And I have to think that diffusion of responsibility is at play. So diffusion of responsibility is something that I learned about when I was a neuroscience mm -hmm. uh, undergrad. And it's this phenomenon where you get a lot of people together and something is happening that clearly a human being needs to intervene on. But nobody does anything because they think the next person is going to do it. And there have been cases of people dying in alleyways, surrounded by windows with people that can hear what's happening in that alleyway. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody at the bottom of the alleyway. They've been raped. They've, they've been battered. They've been mortally wounded. And they scream for help all night long. And nobody helps them. Not because they don't care, not because they're not decent people, but because everybody hears that somebody's in trouble and they're like, somebody else is going to do something about that. It's no big deal. It's not on me. I don't have personal responsibility. Whereas if there's somebody in the middle of the country and you find somebody laying there who's bloody and needs your help, you're going to help them. There's almost no human being on the planet that is going to ignore another human being in distress like that when you know that it's your responsibility to take care of them. But this weird psychological phenomenon happens called diffusion of responsibility and guaranteed that was at play with the cameramen, with I the agree. security guards, with EMS, with Travis Scott. Yeah, 
I, I, I agree. And they all thought that somebody else was going to fix the situation or was in control of this situation. And nobody was in control of the situation. It's very clear that yeah. no one was in control yeah. of that situation. Yeah. And I mean, it, it was incredibly preventable. I mean, really preventable. Man, this was intense, bud. Uh, again, I'm so glad from the bottom of my heart that you are uninjured physically. And I'm so sorry that you had to mentally endure this traumatic event mm -hmm. because I know this isn't going to be the last week that you think about this in your life, buddy. Yeah. And, um, and you know, there, there are a lot of wonderful experiences that you have ahead of you. And a lot of them are probably going to involve big crowds. And it is my genuine hope that this is not something that scars you for the rest of your life. Yeah. I do have a question for uh, those who are going through a traumatic event like this or say in this event, what advice would you have for them to get through this? Like what help could you give them? For anyone that experienced the emotional trauma of what happened Friday, I would encourage you to talk about it as much as you can. An event like this, when you've seen people passed out, when you've seen people die, if you think that you can repress that information in your brain, and make it go away, you're dead wrong. It's not going anywhere. That's going to be in your brain for the rest of your life, whether you choose to acknowledge it or not. So the most important thing that you can do, especially now, especially in these early days, is talk about it. Talk to your loved ones about it. Talk to strangers about it. Go on forums online. If you don't feel comfortable talking to your best friends or your parents, about this experience, go on forums and talk to complete strangers about it. But you need to get this out because if you repress this, if you hold this information down, it's just gonna come out later on and it's gonna come out in the form of anger and in the form of distrust and in the form of frustration. And it, it's gonna negatively affect your life in ways that you will never foresee. I work in emergency rooms. I see traumas all the time. I saw somebody on the verge of dying today, today, this guy who I have seen weekly for the last six months, honestly, because this guy is so chronically ill. He comes in all the time and I had to put a breathing tube down his throat today and he came in not looking like himself. He's gasping for air. He's pushing us off of him because his animalistic survival instincts are kicking in and I had to give him medicine to put him to sleep put a breathing tube down his throat. He's doing okay right now. Uh, you know, only time is going to tell if he survives. But that's a trauma. I experienced a trauma today. And for me to ignore that and pretend like I'm cool, whatever, I'm an emergency doctor. I see terrible stuff all the time is setting myself up for a lot of issues down the road. And you've probably seen in my videos, I'm an emotional guy, you know, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I want to be an emotional person. I want to be able to connect with my family. I want to show my kids that I love them. I don't want to be numb, you know? And your grandfather was an incredible emergency doctor. And I'm sure he was the same way. He wanted to be able to connect with you. He wanted to be able to connect with your dad and your mom and your aunts and uncles. And he did everything that he could to ensure that he didn't become numb and uncaring and yeah. and that's that's what i try to do on a regular basis and that's what i sincerely hope that the people who experience this trauma do as well that's great advice yeah. joe my man thank you so much for being here with us today again so happy that you're okay um again i encourage you to continue talking about this with your loved ones with your friends even strangers if need be and um I look forward to hanging out with you in person at some point, brother. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been heavy as hell. Um, I hope 
things can change moving forward. And I genuinely hope that we can continue to experience live music as a society and in big crowds as well. Maybe COVID isn't the best time to be in big crowds, but barring the pandemic, that feeling of unity is something really special and is something that we as human beings need. We need to feel close to each other. We need to feel close to strangers, as weird and kind of creepy as that sounds. There's something beautiful that takes place when a crowd of hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of people almost fuse minds and have the same experience together. Something really special happens. And, and I don't think the solution is to never let that happen again. I think the solution is to be very aware that this is a possibility and to prepare and to organize and to have fail safes in place if and when this happens again. This is Dr. J. Max signing off.